When SpaceX dismantled Booster 18 after its unfortunate end, engineers finally got to see what's been hidden inside the V3 Super Heavy. The side-mounted oxygen tank looks like something straight out of Alien, a bizarre spider structure branching in all directions toward the inner 13 engines. But why does SpaceX need this strange setup? Here's the real problem. During tower catch, most propellant is burned off. Without this spider tank staying full, those inner engines could starve for oxygen right when precision matters most. So how exactly does this brilliant design prevent catastrophic engine failure at the worst possible moment? The teardown of Booster 18 gave us an unprecedented look inside. What SpaceX revealed changes everything we thought we knew about propellant management during landing burns. Let's break down the core engineering challenge first. When Super Heavy comes screaming back toward the launch tower, it's already burned through most of its fuel during ascent and boost back. The main oxygen tank, which sits at the bottom and normally feeds all 33 Raptor engines, is nearly empty. Any remaining liquid oxygen is sloshing violently around inside. During those final critical seconds before tower catch, if the inner 13 engines try pulling from this chaotic, mostly empty tank, they risk fuel starvation. And starving even one engine during precision landing? That's a catastrophic failure waiting to happen. Here's where the spider tank becomes absolutely critical. This side-mounted structure stays completely full throughout the entire flight. While the main LOX tank empties during ascent, this reserve tank sits there untouched, waiting for its moment. When Super Heavy executes that final landing burn, the spider tank delivers clean, stable oxygen flow to those inner engines precisely when they need it most. No sloshing, no starvation risk, just reliable propellant supply during the highest stakes moment of flight. But the engineering gets even more fascinating. Thanks to RGV Aerial Photography's detailed shots of the disassembled sections, we can see how the propellant lines actually split at their base. Each of the inner 13 engines has dual oxygen feeds, one line pulling from the main tank, another from the spider tank. SpaceX installed valves that can switch between sources mid-flight. During ascent and most of the flight, those engines draw from the main tank alongside the outer 20 Raptors. Then, presumably after the boost back burn completes, the valves flip over to the spider tank, securing that oxygen supply all the way through landing. The spider structure itself looks genuinely alien when you see it exposed. Multiple branches extend in every direction from the central tank, reaching toward each of those inner engine positions. This isn't just a backup tank bolted onto the side. It's an integrated propellant distribution network designed specifically for the catch-burn profile. The fact that SpaceX went with this complex branching design instead of simpler alternatives tells you how serious the oxygen starvation problem was on earlier iterations. Now, let's talk about the methane side, because that system pairs perfectly with the spider tank. The central transfer tube runs all the way down from the top methane tank, heavily reinforced because it's handling extreme pressure differentials. Remember, Super Heavy glides back to the launch site even more than Falcon 9 does. All that liquid oxygen in the main tank pushes against the methane tube during flight, Later, when the LOX tank empties, the methane pressure pushes outward. The structural reinforcement you see isn't decorative, it's absolutely necessary. At the bottom of that transfer tube sits an inverted cone structure that tapers up to a skinnier inner tube. This inner section extends upward just a short distance and appears to be closed off at the top, acting as a pressure-absorbing buffer. Think of it like a water hammer arrester in plumbing systems. Parts of this stay filled with gas throughout flight, helping manage pressure spikes and flow stability. When you're feeding 33 engines simultaneously, smooth propellant delivery isn't optional. 
it's mission critical. SpaceX fills all these interconnected sections at the same time since they're not sealed off from each other. The 20 outer engine methane lines pack tightly around the bottom of this landing tank, which stays full just like the oxygen spider tank. Both systems working in concert ensure that when Super Heavy needs maximum precision and reliability during tower catch, every single engine has clean, stable propellant flow. Compare this to the version 2 Super Heavy design, and the differences become striking. V2 didn't have this side-mounted oxygen tank. It didn't have this dual feed valve system. The entire propellant supply architecture has been fundamentally reimagined for V3. This wasn't incremental improvement. SpaceX completely rethought how to keep engines fed during the most demanding phase of flight. The speed at which they're building Booster 19 proves they've got total confidence in this new design. The first V3 booster, Booster 18, took 71 days between transfer tube rollout and side oxygen tank installation. That was the longest delay between any two sections during its construction. Booster 19, they're demolishing those timelines. The transfer tube rolled out, got lifted into Mega Bay 1, and the spider tank followed shortly after. At 3 a.m. Thursday morning, that distinctive side tank rolled into the build bay, leaving only the aft section before they free up the turntable for the top methane sections. This puts Booster 19 on track to become the fastest constructed super heavy booster ever. When a company starts building this quickly, it means two things. They've solved the major engineering challenges, and they've streamlined the manufacturing process. SpaceX has all the workstations dialed in at the Star Factory. Once they pair this workflow with the brand new Gigabay, production rates will accelerate even further. Meanwhile, testing continues relentlessly. The Booster Forward test article at Massey's just completed its eighth cryogenic test. What's intriguing is that SpaceX still hasn't hooked it up to a can crusher hat to fully stress test those diagonal trusses. They're methodically validating every system, every pressure scenario, every thermal cycle. This isn't rushed development, it's deliberate data-driven iteration. Over at the new Pad 2, that methane quick disconnect hood got reinstalled, sitting flush alongside the liquid oxygen hood. Both deluge systems have been tested multiple times, long duration runs that suggest SpaceX might be planning extended static fire testing, similar to what they've done with Starship at Massey's. The launch mount clamp arm hood started going in as well, sealing off gaps in the table after the arms retract, protecting everything from the fury of 33 Raptors firing simultaneously. Every piece of this V3 architecture connects. The spider tank solves oxygen delivery. The reinforced methane transfer tube handles pressure extremes. The dual feed valves provide operational flexibility. The rapid Booster 19 construction proves manufacturing maturity. The extensive testing validates performance margins. It's all building toward one goal, making tower catches routine instead of miraculous. What SpaceX revealed inside that dismantled Booster 18 wasn't just interesting engineering. It was the solution to landing reliability that transforms Starship from experimental to operational. The spider tank might look bizarre, but it's exactly the kind of brilliant, unconventional solution that makes catching a 20-story rocket booster possible. So here's what the spider tank really represents. This isn't just SpaceX adding another component to Super Heavy. This is the breakthrough that transforms tower catches from experimental achievements into routine operations. Every successful catch depends on those final seconds when 13 engines need flawless propellant delivery. The Spider Tank guarantees that reliability. Think about what happens next. Booster 19 launches, catches perfectly, gets refurbished and flies again within weeks instead of months. Then Booster 20, 21, 
22, each one building on these V3 improvements. The spider tank, the reinforced methane transfer tube, the dual-feed valve system, all of it working together to make rapid reusability real. Because that's the actual goal here. SpaceX isn't just trying to catch boosters for the spectacle. They're building the architecture that makes Mars missions economically possible. Every engineering solution we've seen inside Booster 18's teardown moves us closer to that reality. The alien-looking spider structure might seem bizarre, but it's solving real physics problems that stood between experimental and operational systems. That's the difference between catching one booster as a proof of concept versus catching dozens as standard procedure. If this deep dive into V3's engineering revelations gave you a new perspective on how SpaceX is actually solving reusability, hit that like button and share this with anyone fascinated by rocket engineering. Drop a comment with your thoughts on the spider tank design. What other V3 improvements are you most curious about? And subscribe to Atlas Space so you never miss our technical breakdowns of what's really happening at Starbase. More game-changing SpaceX analysis coming soon. Ship 44 disappeared from SpaceX's production line in August, while ships 40, 41, 42, 43, and 45 through 48 race toward completion with tiles installed and payload sections attached. Ship 44 sits unchanged for four months now. What's SpaceX hiding inside that hull? They need HLS test flights in 2026 if Artemis 3 has any chance of landing humans on the moon in 2027, and pulling Ship 44 in August gives them exactly one year to build the crew compartment and life support systems. Could this frozen starship be NASA's lunar lander? Let me walk you through why this matters more than any other starship sitting at Starbase right now. SpaceX's production floor tells a story. Ship 40 stands complete with its full tile blanket gleaming under the bay lights, already mated to its payload section. Ship 41 mirrors that progress, tiles installed, waiting only for its nose cone. Ship 42 follows the same pattern, though interior systems like COPVs and plumbing still need installation. Then, ships 43, 45, 46, 47, and 48 fill out the lineup, each at various stages of completion. That's eight starships actively progressing through SpaceX's assembly line right now, nearly double what they launched in all of 2024. And then there's Ship 44, sitting exactly where SpaceX placed it in August. No new tiles, no payload section progress, no visible changes at all for four months straight. Here's what makes this pattern impossible to ignore. SpaceX doesn't pause production without reason. Their entire